Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. These are the opening words of Psalm 106, and a fine way for us to begin our time of worship. Friends, it is good to be together for worship by the miracle of technology, to come together and with our praise and with our prayers and together discern how God is speaking to us through the words of Scripture and the Holy Spirit. Today we will conclude our series on the parables, stories that teach, as we consider how our response fits in. Come, let us worship God. The Lord is good. God's, God's steadfast love endures forever. Please join us in the opening prayer. Ever-present God, you never leave us. Help us to stay with you when we are tempted to flee, and keep us seeking after that which is true, that all may know that you are the Lord, our God, a tenacious presence in our world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. open to the promise of forgiveness. Please join us in the prayer of confession. You invite, invite us to your feast, feast O God, God, and we do not come. come. You, you beg, beg us to give, give thanks for life, and we fail in our thanksgiving. thanksgiving. You, you have made for us a wonderful earth, and we neglect the gift. Forgive, forgive us for what we have done, and for abandoning the pathway you desire for us. Be our guide and conscience. Turn our feet and hands to your will, that all we do might give glory to you. Amen. The God of peace, who calls all creation to live in unity, hears your plea. In the mercy of Almighty God, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen.
forgive one another. Peace be with you. And also with you. Peace, Peace be, be with, with you. you. Go. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace of Christ be with you. Hi kids, I'm in the church. You can see I'm in the sanctuary and I wanna show you something that's in the kitchen. So I'm gonna go over there now. So just one minute, I'll be back in a flash, okay? Okay, so here I am in the church kitchen and maybe you've been in here before, but I wonder if you've ever looked through the cupboards. Let me show you what's in these cupboards. In here, uh, maybe you can see it a little bit. We have a whole bunch of dishes, you know, plates and, and platters and things. I mean, oh, just look at this. This is just one stack. There's, there's more of these. We've probably got enough plates here to feed hundreds of people. And we have cups and glasses and platters and serving dishes and, oh, everything we need. And let me show you something else that's really fun. It's over on the other side. In this cupboard over here, we've got a whole stack of these pretty, like, party platters. I mean, we have a lot of them. You could probably have about, mm, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of cookies or cakes. But something else I want to show you, too. Look at this thing. You know what this is? This is a punch bowl. I mean, we have more than just one of these, too. You could make a big, wonderful punch, you know, like with ginger ale and, and Hawaiian punch and maybe put some rainbow sherbet on top. That's good stuff. You know, we haven't had party for a while because we haven't been in church for a while because of the pandemic that's going on. And you probably noticed that Parties just aren't the way they used to be this year. If you've had a birthday or somebody in your family's had a birthday, then, you know, maybe you miss the kind of parties you used to have when you can have a whole bunch of people come over and you can eat together and you can blow out the birthday candles and all that fun. Well, it's not that we aren't going to have parties again. We will. We know we will. And someday, and I hope not too far away, when we're all back in church again and, and we feel safer about the coronavirus, we can have a big party together where we can sit down and we can eat together. That'll be nice. But you know, the church might be thought of as a party just in itself, like all the time. Jesus talks about the banquet that, that God has prepared for all of us. And in that way, the church is a little bit of that banquet right here on earth. Every time we are together as a church, worshiping God, celebrating that, feeling the joy and the love in our hearts, we are participating in that banquet, that party that God has prepared for us. And let me tell you, that party is always there for you. I'm looking forward to seeing you again, friends, and I hope you have a wonderful week. Please join me in prayer. Holy Spirit of God, shine your light upon this word and into our hearts that we may be enlightened with new understanding. Amen. A reading from Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business. 
while the rest seized his slaves, maltreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets, and they gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I think there's a good chance that you're familiar with this parable, but I'm gonna venture a guess and say that you maybe didn't remember that part about the man who forgot his wedding robe. You know, that guy who was thrown into the outer darkness because he was dressed inappropriately. Did you forget that detail? I know I try to. If I preach or teach on the parable of the banquet, I usually choose Luke's version because Luke didn't include all this nastiness, all this violence. Luke's is the G-rated version of this parable, or I might say the good news that goes down easily, whereas Matthew is a story that gets caught in our throats, typical of Matthew. And yet still we might have some conflicting feelings about this story because I think there are some elements to this parable in Matthew that are very appealing to us, elements that resonate with our lives. For example, we understand how it feels to plan an event and then have people just not show up. And on the other hand, we understand being in the position of maybe having committed to something ahead of time and then that something all of a sudden feels like a burden that you would like to find a way to get out of. These things are everyday kinds of experiences, right? But it's a lot harder to relate to the violence that ensues in the story. The invited guests who are so put out about the fact that they're being summoned to this inconvenient banquet that they actually kill the messenger. Or a king who is so offended by the actions of these invited guests that he sends his troops out to burn the city his city. And then in the end, when the banquet is finally happening with the good, the bad, and the ugly, is the king content? No. He zeroes in on one man who was dressed inappropriately, and he orders him to be thrown into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, a phrase that Matthew just seems to be very fond of. It all just feels like so much overreaction. So what do we do? Well, we might do one of two things. First one is we might just look away. You know, forget about all the ugly stuff in the parable. We might even take a Sharpie to the text and, and black out all the offending verses. Or if you're not comfortable defacing your Bible, then maybe just flip over to Luke and read his version. It's in chapter 14. It's a little bit challenging, but really quite manageable compared to this one. Or if you don't wanna do that, if you can't make yourself look away, blot it out, even turn the page, then, then maybe you just push up your sleeves and get to work trying to get a handle somehow on this business of invitations and murder and destruction and weeping and gnashing of teeth. And if we do, then we might learn a few things. 
We might learn, for example, that in the cultures of the Mideast, it was customary to extend two invitations to an event like this one. The initial invitation would be to give the host a head count, and the follow-up invitation was issued when the feast was ready to eat. And so refusing the second invitation, you see, would be quite rude. Basically, the same thing as going to somebody's house for dinner, and then when you're summoned to the table, suddenly saying that you have other stuff to do and just walking out the door. And we might also learn that in that same culture, it was customary for the host to provide a wedding robe for each guest. And so this guy who's dressed inappropriately, it isn't as if he didn't have the right garment, unless, of course, he was a wedding crasher. Another thing that we might learn is that a common interpretation of this story is to allegorize it. That is to say that everything in it is symbolic of something else in the world. And so we might say that the king is God and the son is Jesus. The first guest list is the nation of Israel or maybe the leaders of Israel. That's who he was speaking to at the moment. And the wedding robe, that's faith or Christ, or maybe good works, or baptism, or all of the above. And so then the message of the parable might be that God has invited the people of Israel to be a part of the new covenant in Christ. And if they decline the invitation, they are writing their own death warrant. But even among those who accept the invitation, there are no guarantees. You know, just showing up isn't enough make a mistake and well then there could be weeping and gnashing of teeth and the outer darkness none of this feels very inviting or loving and that i want to say to you is important it is important for us to pay attention to how we feel about the parable more important even than figuring out the parable because a parable is not a secret message that's meant to be decoded and nailed down. A parable is, as I keep saying, meant to be experienced. It's something that falls alongside of our lives, close enough for us to relate to, distant enough to pique our interest. And it is that space in between, between the closeness and the distance, where something can happen. So. Here we are, listening to the story about a king who wants to have a banquet for his son's wedding. And people don't respond the way they should. They don't follow through on their promises. They overreact with gratuitous violence. They are so put off by a message they don't like, they are willing to kill the messenger and a ruler who is so embarrassed by his failure that he starts a war. Somebody who looks different, who doesn't follow the conventions, is vilified. Why? Why? Because these are the things that people do. These are the things that really happen in the world, that still happen in our world. Listen, if you have followed what's happened in Michigan the last few days, where groups of self-appointed guardians of righteousness have schemed to storm the Capitol and kidnap the governor, well then you know. It sounds like a parable, doesn't it? The parable is an observation made by Jesus of what he sees all around him, exaggerated to the degree that we cannot miss how disturbing it is. It is shocking, and that is the point. Somehow or another, it is necessary for us to get the point that these are high stakes. The world is in serious trouble, and God's calling is serious business. Jesus ends the parable with these words, for many are called, but few are chosen. And again, maybe it's hard to know exactly what he means by this, what the difference is between being called and being chosen. But let me suggest to you 
that we hear it this way. The call is an invitation to respond. And the choosing has something to do with our response. This parable works with the two parables that come right before it to tell us a story about invitations being extended and responses made. People saying yes and then failing to follow through. People receiving the good gifts of God and then failing to use those gifts for God's good purposes. People doing things that are destructive of others and therefore self-destructive as well because you cannot hurt other people without also hurting yourself. You know, we might have thought that the parables of Jesus were just cute little stories, but they are so much more than that. Jesus' parables look unflinchingly at a hurting and broken world, a world that is in danger, and they call upon us to make a change, to repent. And underlying all of this is the knowledge that God is true to God's promises, and therefore this is not a blanket condemnation of the Jews. Don't go there. And that God's grace extends backwards and forwards and way beyond anything we can imagine. The truth of this is in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is serious trouble in the world, my friends. But God's grace is unbounded, and there is the hope. All thanks be to our God of amazing grace. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let us join our hearts together in prayer. Mothering God, you never abandon your children. Your steadfast love endures forever. Your faithfulness throughout the generations. Hear our prayers for those in our world whose trust has been broken. We pray for our nation. Almighty God, guide our country its leaders, and all citizens in the way of your mercy, your justice, your truth. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church, that each one of us following Jesus would be truthful, living with simplicity and honesty 
that all the people of the church may live their faith and labor in love for the poor, the homeless, the imprisoned, the persecuted, the sick, and that by God's power, the suffering of all creation may be relieved. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for peace, that wherever there is violence, we may be able to confess our part in allowing the darkness to continue, and that your healing may come to every home. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the sick, the suffering, the lost, and the lonely, for those whose names we don't know, and for those whom we name now in the silence of our hearts. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all the saints that we may remember with gratitude the witness of those who have kept faith in your name. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands we place the well-being of all creation, trusting that you see and know the needs of all through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
God of compassion and generous love, we give you thanks for the riches of the earth, which sustain our lives and which you have created for our joy. We thank you for Jesus, whose life, death, and resurrection and ascension renews our strength and revives our hope. We give you thanks for the Holy Spirit, who comes among us, invites us to dine with each other and with you, and keeps us in faith. Bless our gifts for the sake of those in need and the work of your church. In peace we pray our thanksgiving. Amen. to that which is true, that which is honorable, that which is just and pure and pleasing and commendable, that we may seek to do God's will and praise God's name forever. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guide your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs>